Hello there everyone and welcome to another episode of Mudlarking with Old Father Thames. If you're a frequent flyer with this foreshore forager, you'll know that some episodes are not down on the foreshore and well, this is one of those. As promised, especially to our overseas mudlarking enthusiasts, this episode will feature two mudlarking exhibitions I recently took part in in central London. You'll see hundreds of incredible finds from the number of fellow mudlarks, including my own and, better still, the finds of veteran mudlarks who were on the foreshore in the 1970s and 80s, as well as finds brought into the exhibition, both by curious people seeking identification and those sharing their own astonishing finds. Without further ado, let's get some hands-on history. Hands on History and Mudlarking at Cutler's Hall are two events that took place last week during the month-long Totally Thames Festival 2021. The exhibitions were organised and funded by the most excellent Thames Museum. Over three days, a revolving door of ten mudlarks per day made the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral their home to show their finds and engage with visitors. Here are some of those finds from day one of the exhibition at St Paul's. First up is a selection from the collection of Nick Stevens, co-founder of the Thames Museum and a member of the Society of Thames Mudlarks. You might recognise Nick from the Discovery Channel series Mud Men, alongside Steve Brooker, also known as Mud God. Nick is one of my favourite mudlarking friends and has an astounding collection that he's amassed over the years. One of my favourite finds of Nick's is this incredible spur. It's a direct link to the horrible practice of cockfighting, which was common entertainment in London from the Tudor period onwards. It's said that while cockfighting was bloody and gruesome, one of its merits as a sport was the invention of its complicated and precise rules, which have been credited as an early influencer of hard set rules in other sports. Cockfights took place in a cockpit, a rowdy, boisterous place where classes of all kinds mingled. Most cities had a cockpit and, in London, there were at least seven. Cockfighting was eventually banned across England and Wales in 1835 and Scotland later in the 1890s. Now let's check out some of these padlocks found by Nick. Aren't they wonderful examples? Onto pipes again, some lovely pieces here, and straight into Nick's collection of decorated book clasps. Brass plaques with a couple of real whoppers in there. And over here, decorated cufflinks or cuff buttons. Let's have a peep through the magnifying glass, that should help us to get a little closer. These photos here were taken a couple of years ago before our Foragers of the Foreshore exhibition by photographer Hannah Smiles. The portraits here feature Mackie, Monica, Murph and Stephanie Mills, all mudlarks with years of experience. Hannah also photographed some of our finds as still life. Now who's this lady down a hole? Well, it's Tim Miller's mum, who used to dig holes for Tim on the foreshore. Brilliant, isn't it? Here are some of Tim's finds, and Tim is a Society of Mudlarks member and a long-time mudlark. And he was exhibiting alongside his mother at St Paul's. A selection of Tim's finds here, at some metal bits and pottery. Okay, so here's yours truly, photographed by Hannah Smiles, and here are the selected finds I exhibited at St Paul's Cathedral. You might recognise some of these finds from previous videos, ceramic, bone, metal items. I took quite a lot with me to exhibit, as you can see. It's important to me to let visitors pick finds up and handle them so they can really experience them, and that's why most finds are out on the table there. Over the weekend, people brought in their own finds, sometimes for identification and others just for a show and tell. And fellow mudlark Caroline Nunnally popped in with a selection of her Thames-found pilgrim badges. 
she kindly let me film them to share with you guys. So let's have a look at these. First up is the Thomas Beckett Pilgrim Badge Fragment. This lead alloy mould cast badge has a late medieval date and depicts Beckett returning from exile. This fragment shows part of Beckett upon his horse and would have looked like this one on the screen now. The very best thing about this badge fragment is that the owner has left their own marks on it in the form of two incised stars and a capital letter A. This almost complete badge fragment here is the Shrine of Edward the Confessor, patron saint of Westminster Abbey. It dates to the late medieval period, and what is great about this badge is the intact integrity cast pin on the back here, and I absolutely love the detail and beading around the edges of the badge. You might recognise this badge fragment from an intact version I featured in an earlier video. It's part of a rude cross, the base of it. And you can see here little details of people praying, one on the right there and a headless one on the left. The last badge fragment here has not yet been identified, but you can see a remnant of crozier just here, and my guess is that it may be a fragment of St. Leonard. Let's take a look at the combined finds of Stephanie and John Mills and Ray Love, all longtime mudlarks and members of the Thames Society of Mudlarks. With such a plethora of finds, I'm going to do the best I can to show you as much as I can, but I'll let the finds themselves do the talking. Now this case here with the pewter spoons and ward lock keys is one of my favorites. right next to another of my favourites, featuring military items such as chainmail. Okay, well this here is a real treat. Pentiles found by mudlark Mark Paros of the Society of Thames Mudlarks. And these tiles are incredible, especially because they are either complete or almost complete. They are medieval and date to the 13th to 14th century. Other finds found by Mark include a 15th century child seal ring, engraved Flemish knife handle, terracotta saint and a 12th century silver coin.
Now, a really strange thing happened while exhibiting at St Paul's. Three separate people came in individually with identical items to identify. And I had one of those items too. I have never identified it myself, so I couldn't tell them exactly what their finds were, as the very same object has been puzzling me for years. I felt it was about time to put this mystery to bed once and for all, and set about obtaining a solid ID for the find. But did I get one? The general consensus about this mystery item is that it may be part of a bone lace bobbin. So, it was time to bring in the big guns. Who else but specialist historians in bobbins, Diana Smith, said to have the largest collection of lace bobbins in the UK, and the very lively and entertaining Brian Lemon, author of the Bobbin Dictionary, along with Diana and John Cropper. Our story is a short one, alas, as, despite some vague similarities to a continental cotier bobbin, both Brian and Diana do not think these mysterious bone finds are bobbins at all. So, the mystery remains unsolved. Potential suggestions for these strange identical finds are yarn-winding implements, medical instrument parts, one being a smoke enema, and possibly something relating to handmade Napoleonic prisoner of war curiosities. I will keep on my hunt for the answer and update you all as soon as I have it, if I ever have it. Here we go, something for the metal lovers amongst you, the extremely well-labelled collection of Kevin James Dyer. And here we have the finds of Jason Sandy, Thames Museum and co-organiser of the exhibitions. Jason has some mind-blowing finds, including these large chunks of combed Staffordshire slipwear, and he really has a knack for assembling eye-catching displays. Two of my favourite Jason finds are this torpedo bottle here and this fragment of green glazed stove tile. Let's check out his finds filled display boxes. toys over here, from frozen charlottes or pudding dolls to hollow cast lead figures. And off we go to the dynamic duo of mudlarking, Phil and Judy Hazel, whose finds are plentiful and often get my pulse racing. Just take a look at this lot, stunning. Metal finds, bone finds. And look at those glass bottle seals. My current favourite finds include pieces of kiln and kiln furniture. And this here is a piece of pipe kiln insulation known as a muffle. I've got little bits and pieces of this stuff, but have never found such a large chunk as this. And over now to Ed Bucknell's finds. I like to call Ed the Roman guy. He has so many wonderful Roman finds, including an almost complete Roman pot, which you will see later when I do the Cutler's Hall coverage. Ed is a gifted artist and has completed the missing parts of these dogs here. Look closely. Can you see the pottery fragment of their heads and torso? I say he's the Roman guy, but check out his collection of salt glazed wares. Wow, tens of Bartman necks, intricate cartouches, and even some of the rarer blue splashed Bartman pieces here.
Over here we've got some glorious buckles and more delectable pottery. But the award for chunkiest find of the exhibition goes to this huge lump of pudding stone lovingly carted over to the show. What a guy. Particularly close to my heart because of family ties to Hertfordshire, I was super happy to see this Roman pudding stone quernstone. In Ed's words, this is up a stone from a Roman rotary quern made from the unusual pudding stone, which would have been used for grinding grain. This is a rare stone type, also known as fossil beach shingle, and is confined to small outcrops in and around Hertfordshire. Pudding stone rock was formed approximately 50 million years ago, and pudding stone querns seem to have been made only for a short while at the end of the Iron Age and after the Roman invasion. Ah, here we go. Unable to be here in person, she is here in screen and spirit. Our lovely goddess of the foreshore, Nicola White, aka Tideline Art. We had Sai on this video screen too, so fear not, mud lovers, your boy got a look in. All right, here's some of Ed's work. I'll share his links in the video description, so check that out. Let's leave St Paul's Cathedral now and head over to the home of the worshipful company of cutlers. Cutler's Hall. Okay, so a quick slice of info about the Cutler's Company, lifted from their website. The Cutler's Company is one of the most ancient of the City of London livery companies and received its first royal charter from Henry V in 1416. Its origins are to be found among the Cutlers working in the medieval City of London in the vicinity of Cheapside. As was the case with other trade guilds of the day, its function was to protect the interest of its members, to attend to their welfare and to ensure that high standards of quality were maintained. Their business was producing and trading in knives, swords and other implements with a cutting edge. Over time, the emphasis shifted from implements of war to cutlery and other domestic wares such as razors and scissors. Among the company's collections can be found examples of the whole gamut of the cutler's craft, including swords, cutlery, scissors and surgical instruments. The collection of cutlery ranges from Stone Age tools to the cutlery of today, from the cheapest of mass-produced knives to exquisite items of gold and ivory encrusted with jewels. It is particularly rich in fine continental cutlery of the 17th and 18th centuries. Examples of the craftsmanship of former members of the company, including Ephraim Howe, Peter Spitzer, William Pepys and John Greer, are contained within the collection of London-made cutlery. If you would like to delve even deeper into the history of the company of cutlers, please follow the links in the video description. Now, in this exhibition, I am exhibiting alongside Mudlark's Jason Sandy, Monica Butling-Smith, Ed Bucknell, Lucian, and veteran Mudlark's Graham de Hume and Simon Moore, who is also a cutlery expert and legendary advisor and conservator of natural sciences. In addition to our finds, the cutlers were displaying their own collections, including a seriously huge huge amount of silverware which is only seen on rare occasion and recently acquired knife collection generously donated by Graham de Hume. Let's take a walk through and thanks to Jason Sandy for this footage which he's let me use. Now let's take a closer look at some of the exhibitors finds. First up we have Graham de Hume who was most actively mudlarking in the 70s and 80s. Graham's collection is exquisite. Check out these beautifully preserved horseshoes. And this complete, yes, complete salt glazed Bartman jug. People brought their finds along to show us at Cutler's, and I have got a treat for you. Gold, a golden treat. Real gold and Tudor gold. 
both genuine pieces of treasure. Hold on to your hats, folks, because here is Simon Camp's gold signet ring, most likely owned by a wealthy merchant or businessman in the 16th to early 17th century. As featured in Nick and Jason's book, Thames Mudlarking, Simon's ring features a square-topped shield surmounted with the initials TG and is finely engraved with hounds chasing a rabbit. Now imagine finding this. Simon's luck must have been in that week because, along with his gorgeous ring, he also found the next item around the same time. It's a particularly fine piece of Tudor gold, a 16th century button, perhaps used to ornament a hat or sleeves. I can't tell you how wonderful it was to handle this find and how it immediately transported me to 16th century London. Check out the fine work and how intact it is. And look here, the circular shank, although bent back against the button, is still attached. It's just incredible if you think about how long this is spent tumbling around in the river, in the mud. It's fantastic. At the other end of the metal spectrum, but just as juicy for me, is this cast iron fishing hook with what I think would be classed as a lure, a life-sized fish attached to the middle of the hook. Now I adore fish hooks and would be so excited to find one like this. It belongs to Mudlarka Nicole, aka Larka Lulu, who described the finding of this item as thus. She was pulling it up from the mud and just kept on coming and then suddenly this gorgeous fish popped out, attached to it. What fun! Let's have another look at Ed Bucknell's Roman finds including the cheese press and that almost complete Roman pot. And here also this almost complete onion bottle. On to Simon Moore now and his knife collection is something I am so excited by. Particularly this inscribed Tudor knife and the carved bone handle knives. And this, a tricksy puzzle knife. That's a secret knife or puzzle knife. That's fantastic. So did that operate the mechanism to... That locks it. That, that goes down inside the handle, yep. like that. And it goes through two little eyelets inside. Yep. And does that bit complete the missing gap there it when it's in? When it's in. And that little rivet next to it yeah. is eccentric, it's a false rivet, so it spins around on, the, on, on its side slightly. How so, it, you, so you can pull it away from the from where the pin comes out. Oh, I see. And it's got this hand, the hand it's engraved. It's got a hand and a dagger on it, yes, which points to the, to the, do, the dodgy rivet, so, so, so it gives you a clue how to open it. That's incredible. And also a gravity knife whose function Simon was more than happy to demonstrate. Out of a piece of bone with someone's initials on it. Yeah. Sorry, there we go. Uh, and again, you open it up, got a little recess, uh, and you hold it like that. Uh, to make, okay. And then when you put it back, it, it slips just in, and the blade, the handle clasps it shut so it doesn't open in your pocket. Simon has written a number of books about cutlery, from the very affordable to the more expensive, but there's something for everyone, so check out the links to his books in my video description. Lucian's finds now. Look at these strange objects. Nature embedding and building, wrapping round. Here's an echinoid fossil in flint and a mother of pearl, Nacre, straight into a genuine one-of-a-kind piece of trench art. Look at this little whistle here made from a bullet shell and some carved items back there. So we're over into the realm of Monica now and she is always incredibly creative with her displays. They are fabulous. In the weaponry department, we've got this fearsome machete from the 1800s and above a 1700s dragoon carbine socket bayonet. And here we go. This is what I mean about Monica's displays. Check out these boat hooks, the boat fender and other hardware. Beautiful stuff. And a personal favourite of mine here, let's shine a light on the subject, uranium glass. 
Ever heard the saying, one night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury? Well, very apt to this find, an 18th century syphilis syringe. And over here, more than a one night with Venus kind of thing, it's a lifetime proposal, an engagement ring dating to World War I. Into the display boxes, and here we've got some toys, keys and lots of personal items. Okay, and let's take a look at Monica's menagerie, her breathtaking collection of skulls and bones and teeth, all that kind of stuff. I have no idea how she got it here today. And into Monica's Roman section, we've got plenty of tesserae, pottery and a coin in the middle. And here, the piece de resistance, a genuine Roman oil lamp made in Britain between 70 to 140 AD. What a find that is. So let's finally remind ourselves of Jason's collection. We've got more oil lamps here, but these are actually Hindu offerings. And to round up the day, here are some of Jason's photographs of the stunning Cutler's Hall and their collection. A huge thanks to them for having us. It really was an absolute privilege to be able to exhibit there. And thanks again so much for giving us a meal. After the exhibition closed, we had a silver surface dinner and it really was an exquisite affair. I'd also like to thank Jason and Nick for organising the mudlarking shows at Cutler's Hall and at St Paul's Cathedral, and to every single one of you who came to visit, show your finds and talk to us. I hope if you couldn't make it, you're happy with this video I've made for you, and I know that Jason will also be making a video that he will release after the next lot of exhibitions happening in Chiswick later this month. Links as ever in the video description. All right, so next time you see me, I'll probably be back out on the foreshore. But don't forget, I've also got a Metal Marathon mudlarking special coming up. And if you'd like to find out more about some of the finds I've shared with you today and the process of identification and all the extra information I gather along the way, please subscribe to my multimedia secret mudlarks diary on Patreon at patreon.com oldfatherthems. So until next time, folks. Thanks for watching.